This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. With the help of the Almighty. Thank you, Hashem, for our health and for giving us the ability to study Torah together each week. We are in the Torch Center, and this is this week's Parsha Podcast. It's year eight of the Parsha Podcast. I am your host. My name is Yaakov Walby. You can email me, RabbiWalby at gmail.com. We study together every week to try to go deep and deeper into the Parsha. And of course, we are dedicating our studies today in the merit of our brothers and sisters who are currently being held hostage by the murderous terrorists in Gaza. We hope to hear only good news from them and from the rest of our brethren in Israel and abroad. It's been a very busy week here at the Torch Center. On Sunday, we released the episode with Dr. Kritz, who visited Israel on an intensive Three and a half days solidarity mission, and he shared with us what he learned and what he saw. And just yesterday, we recorded the second episode of the exclusive Torch Insider podcast. It's a completely new format. It's exclusive. It's invite only. Cause the kinds of things that we discuss are, are, are just, they're not for a public forum. It's designed only for Torch Insiders. 
And the only way to access it is via a special invitation link that is emailed directly to the user. So far, we have about a dozen beta testers and the reviews are absolutely rapturous. And we're going to be expanding the invitation list to a few hundred people this week, please God. So stay tuned, O oh Torch Insiders. Check your emails for your exclusive invite link to the Torch Insider podcast. We have an amazing parasha. It's parasha's Tetzave. And for this week's parasha podcast, I have three interesting segments. Join us as we go, Dad. We go deep and deeper in parasha's Tetzave, of course. The subject of the parsha is all about the Kohanim, the special family, the special class, this rarefied fraternity of the special people who are going to do the service in the temple and in the tabernacle, who are the representatives of the Jewish people, who pray for the Jewish people before God. These are the most lofty and elevated family amongst our people. And it begins in our parsha, where Aaron and Aaron's sons are selected and designated from amongst the nation. And Moshe is told to set them aside, to designate them. Aaron and his four sons, they are Kohanim. And they have special garments, garments of glory and splendor. And the artisans and the talented craftsmen, they should make these very special, exquisite garments, and these should be placed upon Aaron, and that will render him, that will elevate him, that will consecrate him as a Kohen, and that is the beginning of the Parsha. Then we have, towards the end of the Parsha, we have the special regiment of what needs to be done during the week of inauguration to actually consecrate and inaugurate both the tabernacle and Aaron and his sons as the priests. And this is a subject that we will revisit, of course, several times uh, going forward in the Torah. The tabernacle will be assembled and be ready. And on the 23rd day of Adar, so a little bit more than 11 months after the Exodus, it's going to be inaugurated. There's going to be seven days of inauguration where, where Moshe is going to serve as the high priest. He's going to wear the special garments. He's going to do all the special services. And Aaron and his sons are going to be waiting in the wings. And then on day eight, which is going to correspond to the first day of Nisan. So it's two weeks shy of the first anniversary of the Exodus. Aaron is going to be handed the keys to the tabernacle. Moshe is going to disrobe himself, divest himself of these special garments, place them upon Aaron, anoint him, and thenceforth it's only Aaron and his family who are the Kohanim. That's a very memorable day. That's a day that's featured many times in the Torah. It's a bit of a tragic day as well because, as we know, Aaron's two sons, are going to offer an unauthorized offering and will die on this very joyous day. It's going to be marred by that terrible tragedy. So I want to begin the first segment of this week's Dad, Deep and Deeper Parsha podcast with something to get us warmed up. And this is something I saw this week and it made me very happy and nostalgic because it reminded me of something that I heard as a kid. And whenever I read things as as an adult that I remember hearing as a kid, it gets my attention. And I guess it's because, you know, I wasn't that great of a student. So the things that actually rose to the top, the things that actually, you know, stuck with me, there must be something uh, particularly memorable about them. And I always feel nice and warm and fuzzy inside when I read something that I remember from my childhood. The paltry amount of Torah that I remember from my youth uh, is is speckled with uh, some of these interesting ideas. So I saw it this week, and I figured I would share it. Uh, it orients around the garments of the high priest. So the parsha begins by laying out all the garments just as a list, and then going through them one at a time to describe how they are made. And Rashi, actually twice, in verse 4 and verse 6 of chapter 28, he spends a lot of time trying to figure out what the aphod, which is the apron-like garment, what it looked like. And 
he gives a very uncharacteristic description. Of course, Rashi's role, his job, his mandate is to explain the scripture and to curate for us what are the teachings in the Talmud that we should know to, be, to better understand the text before us. So if there's a word like aphod, which doesn't appear anywhere else in the Torah, it's a description of one of the garments, and we don't know anything about it, what kind of garment is this, Rashi will define it for us. He'll explain it for us. So Rashi starts off his comment to verse 4, and he says, Lo shamati, I don't have a tradition, and I did not find in any of the literature an explanation of what it looked like. So this is Rashi. If Rashi cannot find it, it means it cannot be found because there's no citation that we can discover that Rashi didn't know. He knew he knew it all. And he says, I don't have a tradition. And I have not found a source that will guide me to know what it looks like. Well, what's the shape? What is the particular nature of this garment, the aphod, that is made? It's one of the eight garments of the high priest. So that's a strange way to start off his commentary. But then he tells us, Another strange thing. Vilibi Omerli. And my heart tells me. So Rashi's like, uh, okay, if I'm going to translate something, I'm going to explain something, I'll go to the tradition and I'll go to the sources. But if I don't have the tradition or the sources, I'll have to just speculate and I will go to my heart. And this is what my heart tells me. And he starts to explain that it is like an apron that has a belt that that come that attaches in the front or that gets tied in the front, but it's sourced in the back. So you have like a garment that just covers the back, and then there's just from the back, there are two little streams that are like a belt that get tied in the front. And then he says, it's similar to the kind of apron-like garment that the royal noble women that they wear when they ride on horseback. This is a very strange Rashi. If you'd Rashi in his commentary to the Torah, which is, of course, the first commentary that everyone reads, the most authoritative, the greatest commentator of them all, you don't have examples of such kinds of Rashi. He's trying to explain what an aphod is. And he says, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a tradition. I, I, the sources don't tell me. My heart tells me it's like this. And then he says, it's, it's kind of like the garments that women wear, the noble women they wear when they go horseback riding. That is a very strange comment from Rashi. And then he repeats it in verse 6. He repeats this idea that it's a kind of garment uh, that uh, it's like an apron-like garment that women wear when they ride horseback. And then he describes in astonishing detail of what it actually looks like. But the first sentence is kind of seems really out of place. My heart tells me it's like the apron worn by noble women. Is this maybe the strangest statement in all of Rashi's commentary to the Torah? And the question that I remember hearing is like, what does Rashi know about women riding on horseback? Was he a fan of the equestrian sports in his spare time? Plus, this is a, more of a sensitive point. In the yeshivos, we are trained that we never said, we never call Rashi Rashi. He's always the holy Rashi. This idea, uh, the notion of Rashi looking at women on horseback, it seems sort of implausible. It can't be that Rashi was the kind of person that would gaze upon women on horseback to see what they're wearing. And the truth is, we know that the Torah sources are very clear that the uh, the practice of, of looking at women who are not your wife, not your relatives, that that's a problem, may be forbidden. This whole, this whole notion of just looking at, at, at women, it's not a Torah practice. So how do we understand this comment in Rashi? I don't know what it is. I have no tradition. And the, the, the Brysa doesn't tell me. The sources don't tell me. My heart tells me it's kind of like the apron worn by women on, noble women on horseback. That's an interesting question. I guess it's an interesting Rashi. Maybe maybe this is why I would stick in my head uh, from my childhood. But this one I remember hearing as a child. 
that there's a concept that the Almighty protects the righteous from errant sins. Of course, we have free will, and we can make choices, and we can make good choices, or God forbid, poor choices. But what about those things that happen that are beyond the sphere of our choice? The things that we see, even though we don't choose to see them. The things that we hear, even though we don't choose to listen in and to hearken to them. The things that we encounter, the, the things that we consume, that we, we don't choose to consume it. There is a concept that's featured in many places in the literature that the Almighty will protect the righteous from errant sins. Meaning, if a person doesn't choose to eat non-kosher, well, what if it happens by mistake? They were given by mistake the one piece of meat. That will not happen to the righteous. Why? God will protect the righteous. Similarly, if you have a a judge, a righteous judge, God will make sure that whatever ruling they render, it will not be the wrong ruling. This is an idea that's featured in many places in literature. And this is perhaps, again, this is what I was told, this is perhaps what happened over here. Rashi is struggling to explain what the aphod is. It's a verse in the Torah, and his, his commentary is supposed to explain it, and the word aphod doesn't appear anywhere else. It's a description of a, a very specific garment, and the sources don't help us, and the tradition doesn't help us. And then Rashi saw an errant vision. He saw something he was not accustomed to seeing. He saw a woman riding horseback. And that's that's strange, because... God protects the righteous from errant sins. And therefore, Rashi in his commentary, he's interpreting it as this was a message from God. My heart's telling me there's a message I received from God that the aphod was like that apron worn by women, noble women, on horseback. That's why Hashem sent me this vision. That's what I remember as a kid. And I happened to have seen it this week and it, it brought me back to that. And I want to kind of talk about this idea. Uh, I'll tell you another story. We might have mentioned this many years ago. But this is a verified, true, documented story that, ha- that happened in our lifetimes. It's about the great Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, who passed away a couple of years ago. But he was the greatest Torah sage in the world. And he knew all of Torah, even the most exotic, esoteric, and arcane parts of Torah. And he was once struggling to understand the anatomy of a particular grasshopper that was featured in one of those esoteric Torah sources. What what does it look like? And as he's struggling to try to figure out what it looked like, something jumps on his book that he's studying. There's a grasshopper of the particular variety that was featured in the literature. And this was not something that was brought to disturb him, but to serve as a divine aid. And he takes the grasshopper and he looks at it and he examines it and he finds an answer to the question. That's how God relates to the super duper uber righteous. And perhaps this is what happened here. And that's the explanation to this otherwise mystifying Rashi. I don't know. I have no tradition. My heart tells me it's like the the, the royal noble women riding on horseback. That is what I was told. And that is, uh, I think, a beautiful idea that I wanted to share with you. And then when I saw this concept this week and it reminded me of what I heard as a child, they also brought another story. And I'm not much for stories. I'm not great I'm not a great storyteller. But this one I really liked. It says about uh, a woman who unfortunately her her husband absconded and she's stuck because she doesn't know where her husband is. And he fled. And they looked everywhere And she goes to the great rabbi and she starts crying, help me, rabbi. My husband absconded. He left. He fled. We looked everywhere. We don't know where to find him. Maybe, oh great rabbi, you could summon some of the divine inspiration, use your low-level prophecy, discover, reveal to me where my husband is. So the rabbi says, well, you know, there's this house in town where visitors come and they could stay there for free. This, uh, many Jewish communities have, uh, like a, like a home which is designated for visitors. Go check over there. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's there. So she goes there and she, to her astonishment, 
she finds her husband. And the whole city was in an uproar. Wow, what a story. Our rabbi is such a sage. He has such a close connection with the Almighty. And he was able to reveal just, he just, how does he know the answer? He doesn't know who this woman is. And he certainly doesn't know who her husband is. And he doesn't know, and he just points, he's like, go there and go find him. And he's, and she goes there and they find him and she resolves all of her problems. He must be a real holy man and he must have some degree of prophecy. So when the great rabbi hears this, he says, no, no, you don't understand. This is not prophecy. This is not divine inspiration. I'll tell you what happened. Every day, I go to the study hall to go study Torah. And I try not to just study Torah in the study hall. You know, some people, they don't study at all. And they have other people that they go to the study hall to study. And the, the greatest amongst us, they don't need to be in the study hall to study. They're always studying. They're, the mind's always engaged in the, the pursuit of Torah. So the rabbi is saying, my, my policy that I always do is when I, I try, when I'm walking, when I'm traveling, I'm, my mind's always thinking about matters of Torah. But as I'm walking today, I, I hear two people talking and they're talking about this new mysterious guest that arrived at the communal home of hospitality and and the rabbi's like, I don't want to hear the conversation. It doesn't interest me. It's not none of my business. And I tried to get my mind to go back to thinking about Torah. But I couldn't concentrate on that. And I was trying to figure out why would Hashem, why would the Almighty have this intrusive conversation in my pursuit of Torah study? Shouldn't he clear that away? Why did I sin that I merited, that I warranted, that I was deserving to have this disruption of my stream of consciousness, my my line of thinking in matters of Torah. Okay, that's the question that he had. And then he went home and this woman comes and she says, where's my husband? So I said, well, maybe that's what Hashem was telling me. And then maybe that was the message. Maybe that's her husband. And that's why Hashem had this, this errant thought or this, this errant little bit of knowledge that uh, interjected, that elbowed its way into my otherwise uninterrupted Torah study. And I just sent her there. And that's where she found him. Now again, this is a nice idea. It's something that I heard as a child. I like it. I believe it. It's a side point on the Parsha. I found it fascinating. And it's a good lesson for us to know that there are people who are operating on a much higher level. And for them, it's not just the conscious choices that they make are going to be righteous and on point. When someone takes the effort to make sure that you know, they're, they're achieving as much of perfection as possible. Whatever is in their control, they're going to monitor, make sure that it's perfectly righteous and in line with the will of God. Then all those things that are outside of their control, the Almighty will make sure that he'll, he'll cover that for them. And that's a larger theme. We see it in a few places, many places really in the literature. If you do 100% of what you can, then the things that you cannot govern well, God will take care of that. And there won't be anything that you wouldn't have chosen to know that God will bring into your purview uh, unless it is actually beneficial for your agenda. Segment number one, a bit of nostalgia. We like nostalgia here on the Parsha Podcast. It's okay, especially when you remember the things that, uh, or one of the very, very, very small amount of things that you remember as a youth. But let us proceed we have the high priest, and we have his eight special garments. And really, the, the whole parsha is about the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and his accoutrements, and paraphernalia, and the coronation ceremony, the inauguration, the consecration ceremony. And I was thinking, you know, most of us, we're not Kohanim. We're not priests. So we're not eligible to be a Kohen, we'll never, we're not part of this very special family. And even those who are part of the special family, only one person can actually be the high priest. So why is this relevant to us? Maybe we should take the Parsha off. Maybe we should say, 
you know what? There ain't no lessons for us over here. I'm not a Cohen after all. Wake me up when Leviticus ends. Wake me up for the more exciting, so to speak, parts of the Torah. There has to be some sort of lesson, some sort of takeaway for us from the descriptions of the high priest and the priesthood in general and the garments of the high priest. What's that lesson for us? So I want to suggest an approach that uh, is a, a little bit of a deeper understanding into this part of the Torah, the garments of the high priest, and in general, the whole notion of the priesthood of Aaron and his sons. So we have these garments. Garments that are made by these very talented artisans and craftsmen. Lechavod velisifaras, for honor and for glory and for splendor. The Talmud gives us an amazing story about a Gentile, a non-Jew. And he happened to walk by, he walked by the uh, house of study, the academy. And he hears uh, the, the Jewish Torah teacher teaching the kids and they're learning our parsha. And the teacher wants to animate and bring the story alive. So he describes all these incredibly intricate and beautiful and gorgeous and splendor is wondrous garments of the high priest. And this piques the attention of the non-Jew. He's like, well, who gets to wear these? Well, it's the Kohen Gadol, they tell him. So this non-Jew has an idea. I will convert. I will become a Jew. And then they will make me the Kohen Gadol. And then I will be able to wear these very special garments. That was his plan. So the Talmud says he went to the, one of the greatest sages of the time. His name was Shammai. And he says, please, I would like to be converted to become a Jew in order that I am appointed as the high priest. Now, of course, this is, this is a, a, a total fantasy because even if you convert, you cannot become a descendant, a direct descendant of Aaron unless you are a direct descendant of Aaron. And therefore, there's nothing that you can do that would render you eligible for the priesthood, much less the high priesthood. Even Jews for thousand, a thousand years, three thousand years, forever. If you're not from this family, it doesn't matter. So Shammai got very frustrated with this guy. He takes a, a brick, the Talmud tells us, and he pushes him away. So he goes across town to the other great sage. He goes to Hillel. And he makes his pitch, I want to uh, convert, so I become the high priest, so I wear the special garments, and the Hillel says, okay, we have a deal, and he converts him. And uh, he says, oh, okay, well, you want to be the high priest? Well, you got to learn some of the laws. I can't just make you a high priest today. You have to first be educated. You have to know the protocols. Deal. Okay, so they sit down, and they and they study. So he reads the verse. The verse says, and... The czar, the foreigner, the non kohen who tries to do worship in the temple will be put to death. This he didn't know ahead of time. This was not disclosed to him ahead of time. So he's a little bit taken aback. He says, wait a minute. Who, who does this apply to? Who is this foreigner, this non kohen that's put to death for doing service in the temple? Service that's reserved for the priests? So they say to him, even David, king of Israel, David Malach Yisrael, even someone as glorious, as honorable, as prestigious as David, if he does work that only a Kohen can do, he is executed. And now he realized the folly of his plan. Jewish people, they're like the sons of Hashem. They're, they're called, my son, my firstborn, O Israel. They're so close to Hashem. Yet, the non kohen can't do any work in the temple. What, what am I? <laughs> my father, my mother, not, I don't have nothing. I don't have that pedigree. I certainly have no business being or consider myself a candidate for the high priesthood. So he went back to Shammai and says, I, I retract my demand or my interest in being a high priest. But they went to Hill and says, Hill. I am very happy that you didn't push me away because now I'm happy to be a Jew and uh, even though I'm going to forfeit I'm being a high priest. So this is interesting. We have, of course, the, the, the story is fascinating on so many different fronts. 
This is featured in the Talmud in the book of Shabbos on page 31a, which is the same book of Talmud that talks about Hillel and the convert who wants to learn all of Torah while balancing on one leg. But here we have a story of a convert or a prospective convert who wants to join the Jewish people because he is, he's so taken by the glory and the majesty of these special garments. Now, ultimately, he's happy not wearing them. But this is, I think, a perspective that many people would have about this part of the Torah. These are such wonderful garments. They're so glorious. They're so gorgeous. They're so striking. And we may think that, you know, this is what a Kohen is. They, they have all the honor. They have the prestige. And Rashi tells us otherwise. What is the definition of priesthood? So Rashi 2, verse 3 of chapter 28 tells us, Velashen kahuna, the word kahuna to be a Kohen, sherus hu. It means service. The notion of service, it's a very different idea than what this Gentile wanted. He didn't want to go into service. He wanted the honor. He wanted the prestige. He wanted the glory. And it seems like there's maybe two different ways to view the Kohen. There's the way he viewed it when he was desirous of converting. And then Rashi is telling us that really it's about service. In a couple of months, we're going to read about Korach. Korach was a Levite, like Moshe and Aaron, but he was passed over for some promotions. And he launches a rebellion, a mutiny, an insurrection against Moshe, against Aaron, against the entire establishment. And he's levying a claim that Moshe and his brother are taking all the glory for themselves. Why should Aaron be the high priest? I should be the high priest. Why should he have all the glory? Why are you lording over the people? Why are you superior to me? Why do you maintain supremacy over me? Are you better than me? Are you worthier than me? What does a coin represent? What do these garments represent? In the eyes of this convert, before he converted, in the eyes of Korach, they represent a certain superiority, a certain nobility of glory and honor that makes this person tower above others by dint of them having this designation. And what she's saying to be a coin is, is to be in service. And these garments were a form of service, service of God and service on behalf of the Jewish people. And the Talmud goes through each one of these garments and says that each of these garments, it wasn't just something that you wore. It was a form of prayer. It was a form of penitence. It was a form of repentance. And it goes through the Talmud in the book of Zavachma on page 88b tells us, that each one of these garments was a form of prayer and repentance for a different class of sins. So the tunic, that atoned for murder. And the breeches, the pants, that atoned for illicit sexual immorality. And the hat, that atoned for pride. And the, the sash, the belt, that atoned for the murmurings of the heart, the sins that happen in the heart. And the choshen, the breastplate, that atoned for improper judgment, improper jurisprudence. And the aphod, the aforementioned apron-like garment, that atoned for idolatry. And the meil, the robe, that atoned for lashon hara. And the tzitz, that special plate of gold that went on the forehead of the high priest, that atoned for brazenness. So if we were to look at these garments, we would like, wow, look at that high priest, look how glorious and and look at the splendor of that garment. And that's true. But the Talmud is revealing to us that this was a form of service. All the sins of the Jewish people that fall under the category of murder 
all that were atoned when the high priest did whatever he was expected to do when he wore the the tunic. And when he wore this other garment, that was a form of, of prayer and repentance for the illicit uh, immorality. And the hat, it's not just the glorious hat that is so appealing, that was a form of repentance, of atonement, for being haughty, and so on. And the commentaries take it even a bit further. Not only did this this set of garments that Aaron wore, did it provide atonement for his people in his time, it provided sweeping atonement for all of humanity, for all time. After Adam and Eve sinned, God made them kosnos ar, leather garments. The word kosnos is the same word as the chsonis, the tunic. And the Midrash explains, this is one of those wild comments in the Midrash that really connects these very disparate ideas. What garments did, did Adam get? What were these garments, these leather garments that God fashioned for Adam and Eve? The Midrash tells us that they were the garments of the high priest. How do you atone for the sin of the first, first couple, Adam and Eve, in the garden? You atone with the garments of the high priest. And thus, when the high priest wore these garments, he was trying to cleanse and to repent and to pray and to expiate the world and the nation from the sins, from these eight different classes of sin. But he's also trying to cleanse the world from the original sin of Adam and Eve that caused the catastrophic degradation of humanity. And the commentaries go even further. And they point out how these eight garments that correspond to these eight different classes of sin that were atoned by the high priest wearing them, these eight different sins were actually part of Adam's sin. Adam's sin, when he ate from the fruit, it had an element of murder in it. Why? Because Adam's sin condemned humanity to mortality. The day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Okay, so that's an act of murder. And thus, the chson is the tunic that atones for murder. It's not just the murder of the people of the Kohen God, the high priest's generation, his contemporaries. It also is an atonement for the murder element of Adam's sin. Adam, the Talmud tells us, his sin was akin to the reversing of his circumcision. Of course, we know that the circumcision, the covenant of the circumcision, it's very much associated with the notion of fidelity in matters of sexuality. And thus, if Adam's sin was an element of reversal of a circumcision, it's a sin that has some sexual immorality associated with it. And thus, the mechassayim, the breeches, the, the pants, the trousers, the trousers for our brothers and sisters in the commonwealth. That garment atoned for the Immorality inherent in Adam and Eve's sin. The next one, the the head covering the hat, that atones for haughtiness. Well, is there anything haughtier than violating the will of God? The avnate, the sash, that atones for the murmurings of the heart. The Talmud tells us that that, what does it mean, the murmurings of the heart? It's reference to heresy. And the Talmud also tells us that Adam was a heretic. His act was an act of heresy. And thus, when the Kohen God wore this garment, that was an atonement for the heretical elements of Adam's sin. The Talmud tells us further that Adam's sin was a miscalculation in judgment. He heeded the student and not the teacher. The, the serpent said, you shouldn't have listened to me, you should listen to the master. That is a mistake in judgment. And that's the choshen, the breastplate, which atones for judgment and atones for the misjudgment, the miscalculation in judgment that Adam made when he did his sin. The aphod, well, that's for idolatry. Well, the sin of Adam, that's idolatry. The serpent told Adam, oh, God ate from the tree and that's how he became all powerful. You'll do the same. You'll become like God. That is textbook idolatry. Adam accepted Lashon Hara about God and thus the robe atones for that. And is there anything more brazen than violating the will of God right in front of him, right after he was commanded to do it and thus that sits that final headband, if you will, of the high priest 
that atones for brazenness atones for Adam's sin, or the element of Adam's sin that was brazenness. This is a very sophisticated view, deep and deeper, of the ultimate objective of Aaron and his garments. It's to atone for the whole nation, but really for all of humanity. And back to the original sin of, of Adam and try to reverse it, try to atone and rectify what humanity got wrong at the very inception. These garments, yes, there is an element of, of splendor and glory that is bestowed upon Aaron, but really it's, it's service. And the amount of work that you have to do, <laughs> repentance doesn't happen on its own. There's no such a thing as a spiritual transformation happening just because. Aaron had to channel whatever you need to atone for each one of these specific classes of sin. He had to channel that into his avoda, his service in wearing these particular garments. And he's atoning for the nation and he's atoning for the original sin of Adam. That's the role of the high priest. That is his mission statement. That is his, his job description to serve. Anyone who dies accidentally, the Talmud tells us, that falls on the back, on the shoulders of the high priest. He is culpable, and that is why those who are in the cities of refuge, those who have committed murder accidentally, they go free when the high priest dies because he's really responsible. He is responsible for the people that he serves. Now, Moshe was supposed to be the high priest, but he lost it. Why did he lose it? So we know this. When God was entrusting Moshe in the sacred mission of going to save the Jewish people from Egypt, Moshe launched a series of objections. And his final objection was send Aaron instead. Moshe is worried about Aaron's feelings. To a certain extent, perhaps we can say, Moshe viewed the leadership as a privilege, not as a responsibility, as an obligation, as service. The whole idea of Aaron having envy, that's only possible if you view that leadership position as a privilege. But the truth is Aaron was all about service. He was happy in his heart that Moshe would be the leader. He did not view it as glory, as distinction, as stature, as supremacy. He viewed it as service. And that's why he is, in fact, worthier than Moshe to be the high priest. I was chatting yesterday with my friend, Dr. Jeff, and he pointed out something amazing. It's interesting. There's another person in the Torah called a Kohen. Even though he's not a Kohen, he's not a descendant of Aaron. Jethro is called a Kohen. My friend Jeff pointed out that Jethro also displays this quality of service above above all. Jethro was someone who blessed Hashem, the Talmud tells us, in a way that no one else had previously done. He blessed Hashem for the triumph of others. Korach, he views the garments as splendor, as honor, as glory, as supremacy. The truth is, it's service. And Aaron, celebrating others because he views it as a collective mission, and if Moshe does it, that's great. Jethro did the same, and maybe that's why the Torah gives him the designation of being a Kohen. And one more thing from that to Jeff, another great analogy. If you go to a wedding... And you see the waiters, and they're dressed in the fine tuxedos. Everything's perfectly pressed. And they have the nice gloves on. You may think that they are the stars of the show. After all, they're all dressed up. But the truth is they're there to serve. And this is a deeper view of the priesthood. Of course, Aaron, he's, you know, maybe the second greatest person in, in history. We're told, Rashi tells us this, that he's equal to, to Moshe. He's Moshe's partner in everything that they do. And he is worthy of distinction and honor. But there's an element of priesthood that is service. And I think, 
you know, us non-Kohanim, we read the parsha, we find a lesson that's very valuable to us. We are urged in the Mishnah to be students of Aaron. Aaron loved peace, pursued peace, loved humanity, and brought them close to Torah. It's all about others. Peace. Love it. Pursue it. Love humanity. Love other people. And find a way to be at their service, bringing them to Torah. The priesthood. There's an element of it, perspective of it, of service. Service of God. Service of others. And I think that's a lesson for us. We too should embody that, embody this quality, even though we cannot, or maybe you can. I can't. <laughs> I can't be a Kohen, but Jethro was a Kohen as well. Why? Because he had an element of this, of viewing distinction and greatness that others have. And being happy with that because after all, what difference does it make? We're here in service of Hashem. Who cares if you have the glory or if I have the glory? It doesn't really matter. If we have that attitude, we too are students of Aaron. And to a certain extent, the notion of, of priesthood can be applied upon us, even though, of course, we can't do any service. We're not actually Kohanim, but the lesson, the, the principle, I think, is a valuable one for us. And that brings us to our third and final segment. And just as we're trying to do in this whole year to see a bit deeper, to get a deeper view of the priesthood, a deeper view of these garments, there is a deeper view of one of the most difficult portions in the Torah that we're going to try to convey today. So chapter 29 begins the outline of the inauguration ceremonies of the tabernacle. And verse 1 we read, this is what you should do to sanctify them so they they can serve as Kohanim, they can serve before me. And it lists the various sacrifices that Aaron must bring on the eighth day of the inauguration, on that day of that handover, when Moshe retires permanently as a priest and he consecrates Aaron and his sons, he anoints them with a special anointment oil, they are the priests going forward there are a series of sacrifices that they must bring. Now, this will not be done until much later, the book of Leviticus, seven days they're under Moshe, he assembles, disassembles the tabernacle, the the future Kohan and Aaron and his sons are in waiting. Moshe wears for these seven days, he wears the garments of the high priest, does all the services of the high priest. And then on day eight, we have the handover to Aaron and his sons, and they, going forward, they're going to be forever the priests. And this, again, the memorable day, memorable day, the first day of Nisan, almost a year after the Exodus, a day that is tinged with tragedy because Aaron's two sons bring that unauthorized offering and are struck and killed by a heavenly fire. But it lists over here some of the sacrifices that are brought on this day. And the first sacrifice that is mentioned, par echad. Par echad, one bull. Why does Aaron, on day eight of the inauguration, which is really day one of his tenure as the high priest, why does he bring a bull? So Rashi tells us, Lechaper al Maisa Egal, to atone for the sin of the golden calf. And a calf, Rashi tells us, that's a bull. A calf is a baby bull. A bull is a big bull but they're the same animal. And because the sin of the golden calf, that's really what's being atoned for by the tabernacle writ large, but even by Aaron specifically. Therefore, on day one, when we inaugurate, we kickstart Aaron's tenure as a high priest in the tabernacle, he brings an offering, a sacrifice of a bull, one bull. Why? To atone for the sin of the golden calf. Calf, well, that's part of the same, that's the same species. It's a bovine, baby bovine, and when it grows up, it becomes a bull. So that's what we're told here in Rashi. Now you'll notice, and the Maharal points this out, that this particular sacrifice, this bull, is brought only on day eight of these eight days of inauguration. And that's the day that Aaron takes over. Well, Moshe, he did not bring this bull during the first seven days of the inauguration, eight days. 
because Moshe, he had no part in the sin of the golden calf. He was, after all, in heaven, as we know. We're going to read about the golden calf next week. And as I mentioned in the past, the chronology, at least according to Rashi, the chronology is not the way it's presented in the Torah. There was first the sin of the golden calf, and then there was the instructions to assemble the materials for the Mishkan and the instructions of our parsha. But for a variety of reasons, it was organized like this. So when the instruction to bring the bull was, was already after, chronologically, after the sin of the golden calf happened. Well, who did the sin of the golden calf? It was Aaron. And on some level, and we have spoken about this in the past, on some level, Aaron was complicit with the, this sin. And therefore, it's appropriate that Aaron, and not Moshe, he offers this bull sacrifice to atone for the sin of the golden calf. Moshe had nothing to do with it. He was in heaven after all, and therefore, it's not appropriate for him to bring the, this one bull. It will be brought by Aaron. So that's this comment in Rashi. If you read the whole parsha, you probably miss it. Because, okay, well, you know, one bull, okay, we, we got it. One bull, you read Rashi, okay, it's for the golden calf. And we know that the tabernacle, it's there to atone for the sin of the golden calf. Fine, you bring a bull. But the Maharal, he asks an awesome question. He says, wait a minute. The sin of the golden calf, that was a calf, a baby bull. A baby bovine. So why, if you're going to atone for the sin of the golden calf, why are you going to bring a bull? It seems like a very basic question. You could have just as easily brought a calf. What's wrong with that? If we're trying to atone for the sin of the golden calf, why would you bring a bull, which is a, it's a, it's a different name. And he even tells us that A bull is a three-year-old bovine, and a calf is a one-year-old. So the sin of the golden calf was a golden calf, right? Not a golden bull. So if you're going to bring an atonement sacrifice to atone for the sin of the golden calf, well, bring a calf. Don't bring a bull and say, well, a calf is, after all, it's kind of like a bull. It's the same species. Bring a calf. What a question. But his answer is, is just amazing. You know, we think of the sin of the golden calf. It's a very hard sin for us to understand. You know, this is a few weeks after the sign of Revelation. Jewish people witnessed God. God tore open the heavens, as we mentioned a few times in recent podcasts. Atta Haresa Ladas. We were shown to, uh, to know that there's only God. God tore open the heavens. And he shows there's nothing besides for God. And then there's this golden calf. Where it seems like the nation descends to this terrible low of idolatry. And they make this golden calf to worship and they say, This is your God, O Israel, took you out of the land of Egypt? We always have a hard time understanding the rationale of the golden calf. And we talked about this many times in the past. Well, they didn't really want an idol. They wanted a place for Moshe. It wasn't really Jewish people. It was the, 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 uh, members of the, of the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. Oh, and Aaron had his rationale for it because he was the priest and, and he was also a prophet and they would have killed him. It would have been unforgivable. We've spoken about this many times in the past, but still the whole notion of, of this sin, it doesn't make any sense. Listen to this. Listen to what the Maharal tells us. In the book of Ezekiel, it starts off with the vision of Ezekiel. And it starts off with the chariot, the Merkava that he saw. Now, I will, I will tell you, you can open up the book of Ezekiel, read chapter 1, verse 1, and read the whole chapter. And it's clear that what you're reading is the absolute deepest secrets that we are aware of. And in fact, when the Talmud wants to define the secrets that are totally beyond most of our comprehension, the textbook definition of that is Maisa Merkava, is the episode of the chariot, the chariot that Ezekiel witnessed. And you may wonder, you know, what, why does Ezekiel tell us about this? Why does he share of, of this vision when it's completely baffling? But he does say things that we can translate. We can 
he's the, the words that he says, even though the, the, the vision that he has is totally beyond our comprehension, there are terms that we are familiar with. So we can understand the terms, but not comprehend what they mean. And he talks about four figures. The human, the lion, the eagle, and the bull. Now again, we have no idea what this means. But these are the best words that Ezekiel found to describe his vision. Now we know that the Jewish people at Sinai, they also had a vision. On some level, they experienced prophecy. And our sages tell us that the prophecy that they experienced was something that resembled, something that was akin to what Ezekiel saw. And the Jewish people wanted to have some sort of physical representation of that. So when Moshe was around, Moshe has their physical interface between them and God. The Jewish people could ask Moshe any question in the world, and he could ask God, and thus the presence of God was felt by dint of Moshe, the man of God, Ishalokim. He's in their midst. They have this, this touch point with Sinai. But when Moshe was gone, or at least it appeared that he was gone, they thought it was gone. They wanted to have something that was super close, so to speak, to God that will remind them of God. Again, at Sinai, they had something which changed their lives forever. They had some sort of vision that included something that resembles what we call a bull. So they sought to make a bull that would remind them of God. Now they understood that God has no image. And even the things that are close to God, so to speak, whatever vision, whatever it even means, this vision, even that it's inappropriate, it's oxymoronic to construct an image of. Just as it's totally inappropriate and and wrong and oxymoronic to construct an image of God, even that bull, that heavenly vision that appeared in some way to resemble a bull, that too will be too much to create an image of. So they settled. They settled on a baby bovine. They made a calf. The calf would remind them of a bull which in some way was similar to something that they saw at Sinai. And that would remind them of God and of Sinai in a way similar to the presence of Moshe when he was in their midst. So this is how he answers the question. Moshe is telling the Jewish people, Moshe is going to tell Aaron on day eight, you bring a, a bull. The first sacrifice is a bull. Why? To atone for sin the golden calf. The calf is also a bull. Well, bring a calf, not a bull. The fact that they're bringing a bull, it's revealing to us, and of course the Midrash says this as well, that the roots of the sin of the golden calf was actually a golden bull. And it related to the vision that they had at, at Sinai. Now, to me, this was a bit of a game-changing idea. Because when you read the Torah, and you read chapter 32, we're going to read it next week. You read about the sin of the golden calf. And it sounds, on a simple level, like the nation that experienced this incredible vision of Sinai is repudiating the vision of Sinai. And they say, no, 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 the God that we saw at Sinai, no, we want an alternative. We want this golden calf. And that's, it's, it's completely baffling to us. And here, what the Maral is revealing to us is that, no, 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 they never wanted to replace God. They wanted to have a certain representation of God. And they wanted, or not to make a physical representation of God, because that's inappropriate. And even the bull is inappropriate. So we'll make, we'll make a calf. Now, the truth is that's too far. Because we don't make a representation, not of the calf, not of the bull, and certainly not of God. But to me, this was a game changer because it, it shows a certain degree of sophistication, a, a much deeper perspective of what they wanted to do. And of course, they went wrong. 
but the 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 atonement they brought a bull because the actual sin it was really because they saw something that we would call a bull as Ezekiel does that's what they saw at Sinai that's what they wanted to perpetuate so again it's a much more sophisticated and nuanced and, and subtle interpretation of the sin of the golden calf and that's what we're doing here on the Parsha podcast year eight we're going a bit deeper we're seeing a little bit of different angels beneath the surface, beyond the veneer, behind the facade, backstage, in the substratum of the parsha. That's what we're doing here in the Torch Center. And I am privileged and honored to be doing this with y'all. My email address is rabbiwolbygmail.com and I will bid you farewell. Have a wonderful rest of your day. A sensational, terrific inspiring, exciting, restful, quiescent Shabbos upcoming. I'm pleased, God, with the help of the Almighty in good health and in good spirits, we will once again gather together around a cackling fire and study the Parsha next week. The email address is, again, rabbiwolby at gmail.com.